To come up with a complicated problem for average and instantaneous acceleration, we go back to the mass on a spring. So, mass on a spring described by this position. This is the same as our previous example. And the question is, what is the average acceleration between t equals zero and a half cycle, b between t equals zero and a whole cycle, and then c, what's the largest instantaneous acceleration? So, just to have nice plots, I drew them ahead of time. This is the position as a function of time, because we know it's a sine. And the amplitude is 8, so I know that's 8 centimeters right there. And then we also would know, I guess, that's negative 8 centimeters right there. So let's look first at part A. The thing to remember about averages is they only depend on the final and the initial. And also, you don't really need the actual acceleration to get the average acceleration. It depends on final and initial velocity. So we just need V. Right. And this is calculus-based physics. So we know how to use calculus to get v for a position. We know that it is dx dt. So we're going to take the derivative, and we know, let's say, to take a derivative of a sine, you take what's inside times time, and you just pull it out and multiply it by the prefactor. So that comes out to 48 pi. And the sine becomes cosine. And the inside, say, is the same, 6 pi. Uh, that is i hat centimeters per second. So there is the velocity at any time. So now we know the average acceleration is the final velocity minus the initial velocity over delta t. Oh, they're all vectors. All right, final and initial. Well, we care about the point at zero and a half cycle. So we care about here and here. And we don't really care about position, we care about velocity. So well, let's see. Here is a velocity plot now. You can see uh, the velocity is a cosine function. That's what I've plotted here. You know the amplitude is 48 pi, so that would be 48 pi. If this were in centimeters per second, and that would be negative 48 pi down there. Let's see, we need the thing at uh, a half cycle. So let's see, at a half cycle we're here, so the velocity has made it down to negative 48 pi. So v final is minus 48 pi, and minus v initial is 48 pi. So minus 48 pi minus 48 pi over delta t. Well, let's see, delta t is one half of the period of the oscillation. So really to do this when you gotta know a little bit about sinusoidal motion, you gotta look at this and say, how long is the period? Well, you could get it from here and find the zeros, or you could just know that for a function like this, it's the frequency times two pi t. So the frequency of the motion, f, has to be three hertz. Because right, then that would be 3 times 2 pi times t. That's how you make a, that's how you plot sinusoidal motion. If that's the case, then the period is one third of a second. And if that's the case, a half of the period, which is the delta t we care about, is one sixth of a second. I won't put the unit in there. All right. So this becomes 96 pi, or negative 96 pi. You multiply it by 6, and you get some large number of minus 576 centimeters per second squared. Uh, I'm sorry, I usually do the unit vector first. Minus 576 I hat centimeters per second squared. That is the average acceleration for this part of the motion. Now let's see, does it make sense? It does, because the motion is initially going up and it's slowing down, and it's eventually going down. That would mean it's accelerating down. The acceleration should be down. Sure enough, it's negative. So the answer makes sense. It's not a constant acceleration. It's a varying sinusoidal acceleration, but the average value in that domain is right there. Let's look at part B. Now we want the average between time equals zero and a full cycle, all right? So, well, it's the same strategy. A average final minus initial. Velocity final after an entire cycle 
is back up to 48 pi minus velocity initial 48 pi. Uh, the delta t would be a full period, so it would be one third of a second, but it doesn't matter because our delta v is zero. We started out with a velocity up 48 pi centimeters per second, we ended 48 uh, pi centimeters per second. All the exciting stuff in the middle doesn't matter because this is an average. So the answer is zero. Zero hi hat centimeters per second squared is the answer for part b. So in sinusoidal motion, once you go through a full cycle, the average acceleration that you've experienced is zero. Let's see if I can fit part C right here. What was part C? Part C asks for what is the largest instantaneous acceleration? Well, to get that, it'd probably be best to just write an expression for the instantaneous acceleration and try to figure it out. So we know that A instantaneous is dv dt. So we really just have to take another derivative. So we want a derivative of the velocity expression. So let's see. So you pull the 6 pi, the derivative of this part with respect to time out, the 6 pi comes out, multiplies the 48 pi. So 6 times 48 is 288. And then you got pi squared because there were the two pi's there, and cosine becomes negative sine when you take its derivative. Negative 288 pi squared sine, and then the inside stays the same, 6 pi t. And that is i hat centimeters per second squared. There's your acceleration, um, instantaneous acceleration. So the answer then, what we ask for, is the largest instantaneous acceleration. That kind of sounds like a magnitude, not a vector. So it's like just how big is it? Is it positive or negative? doesn't matter how big is it. The answer is simply whatever is in front of the sign. The 288 pi squared. So the answer then is 288 pi squared centimeters per second squared. And you can say, oh, but it's negative, but it's a sinusoid. At one point it'll be negative, one will be positive. It'll go up and down. So that is for a complicated motion, how to calculate those two quantities.